Hi everyone, it's Sandra. So it was eight days ago that I decided to boost the bacteria around some cocoons that I saved from a dusty dry condition by introducing a nanny worm. So today we're gonna to check in on the nanny worm and I'm going to talk you through some more of the worm science behind cocoons and their hatching. Everything I say in this video is based on published research on Icinia fetida. I'll put the links in the description. If you like my worm science videos, please subscribe, click that notification bell, and put in the comments your experiences. We all can learn from each other. I'm doing this experiment and looking at the research not only because I found my dry cocoons, but many of us get cocoons from a breeder. So knowing the conditions, the soil conditions, the temperatures and the resources that will help these cocoons hatch, I think will benefit all of us. We all know that worms reproduce rapidly, but their rate of multiplication is not always as great as might be theorized. The rate of cocoon production by worms is just one factor, but how many wisps emerge from those cocoons is equally important. I've looked at worm reproduction and the conditions best to produce the most cocoons in a previous worm science video, and I will put the link to that in the description. I'm testing out whether increasing the diversity of the microbiome around cocoons will help them develop, especially in my case when they were previously subjected to drought. So I'm looking for signs of life in this bin as I go through it. I know I have a nanny worm in here, but this, nope, thought that might be a wisp, that's not. I'll also link to last week's video where I showed the introduction of the nanny worm. This is also based on worm science that a microbially rich environment is a handshake to developing cocoons to tell them, come out, come out, it's safe to emerge. I feel bad, she's all alone, but then again, she has all the food to herself. So the research that I specifically looked at for today's little video looked at the temperatures at which cocoons are most successful. Not only the average or mean temperature that the cocoons are subjected to, but also whether the temperatures vary or stay steady over a 24-hour period. So I'm going to talk about several aspects of this research. First, how many cocoons are produced at varying temperatures? And secondly, how many hatchlings actually emerge from those cocoons? The research compared four different temperatures and also whether those temperatures stayed steady or fluctuated overnight. The researchers noted that a sign that a cocoon was maturing was its level of transparency. And I'm delighted that some of these cocoons are starting to look a little bit transparent compared to when I put them in there. I'm going to show a chart now from the research that I'll bring you back if I find anything exciting. So this chart shows cocoon production at those four temperatures that I mentioned. It goes from a high of 25 degrees Celsius, which is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit, down to a low of 10 degrees Celsius or about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The solid lines represent if those temperatures are kept constant versus the dashed line, which is the temperatures fluctuate between night and day. You can see that 25 degrees Celsius, both the constant and the fluctuating experimental conditions far outperform the other temperatures for cocoon production. 20 degrees Celsius, which most people think is room temperature of about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, is much better at constant temperatures than it is when it fluctuates. At both 15 degrees Celsius, which is 59 degrees Fahrenheit, and then, like I said, at 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, worms produce cocoons at a much lower level, but there doesn't seem to be much difference between constant and fluctuating temperatures. But as the saying goes, now we need to know the rest of the story. So that describes how many cocoons are produced, but how many wisps actually emerge from those cocoons. So let's look at what the researchers found. 
Here's a chart that summarizes how successful cocoons were at hatching out live worms at various temperatures. This has implications for if you buy cocoons to know what temperature were these cocoons before you receive them. The first thing you might note is there is no 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit represented on this chart. And that's because that even though worms were producing cocoons at 10 degrees Celsius, which the previous chart showed, no hatchlings emerged after 230 days of incubation at 10 degrees Celsius. Amazing. So the bottom line with this chart is that 20 degrees Celsius or about 68 degrees Fahrenheit outperforms all other temperatures, both at the constant level and at the fluctuating level. It outperforms in terms of the percent of cocoons that hatch and it outperforms in the number of hatchlings that come out of each cocoon, the highest being achieved with fluctuating 20 degrees Celsius temperatures and producing 3.2 wisps per cocoon, 100% of the time. If all you're interested in is cocoon production, then 25 degrees Celsius in the previous chart was more successful. But if you're interested in wisp production, then you might want to be looking at the slightly lower temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. The researchers hypothesized that at the higher temperature, fewer eggs were fertilized in the cocoon, yielding fewer wisps. What gives me hope that these cocoons will survive that dry spell they were subjected to earlier in the spring is this research showed that those cocoons produced at 10 degrees Celsius that did not mature in 230 days, if they transferred those Icinia fetida cocoons from 10 degrees and put them in 20 degrees Celsius, those cocoons produced viable, alive wisps in just 14 days. All right, nanny worm, get to work. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye for now.